you know, we, we build these worlds that are based upon values that make sense for an economy, but that don't make sense for us as individual homo sapiens. And then we wonder why we're not happy. You know, it's, it's like we're wearing shoes that are not shaped like a human foot. It's not to be comfortable. And yet we're trying to cram our feet into these strangely shaped shoes. Much better to go barefoot. Welcome to Take a Deep Breath. Today's Breathcast guest is Dr. Chris Ryan, PhD. And Chris is the author of Sex at Dawn and Civilized to Death. And he has a very big podcast called Tangentially Speaking. Um, and I've been listening to that podcast since about 2013, 2014. And Chris has absolutely changed my life. Um, listening to this person and his stories about travel and life and sex and health and all these things. Um, and I just remember very early into podcasts, listen to who the heck is this guy? He was on Joe Rogan. Um, and, and I just aligned with his thoughts and feelings. And uh, I've been an avid listener of his podcast ever since. So I can't even begin to share my excitement and happiness that I got to sit down and ask Chris questions because it is, is a dream. It really is. Um, and uh, he, he didn't disappoint. Um, we talk a bit about breath work as well, but this is so much more than that. You know, we're talking about life and death and travel and what it means to be alive right now, how to live a good life. And I really think you're going to get so much uh, from this this breath cast, this podcast. Um, I've linked to some of Chris's stuff down below. So, so make sure you go and follow Chris on Twitter. Check out his website. Um, interestingly, I'm also supporting Chris now as we've built a connection I'm actually supporting him with uh, his uh, his YouTube channel so uh, you can go over and you can follow his YouTube channel where I'm actually putting episodes of his podcast on which again is an absolute dream to work with this guy in any way is 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 is, is wonderful so I, I you know I'm probably geeking out here and, and I'm totally fine with that um, before we get stuck into this amazing conversation, um, just a couple of bits I want to share with you so number one is um, this podcast is brought to you in conjunction with our other channel, Hypnotherapy Unleashed. And as you know, breathwork is a very powerful tool that can help with the mind and de-stress, help us think clearer, get more energy, get more clarity. Hypnotherapy is another tool that does that as well. So no matter what it is that you're kind of working on, whether it's maybe some form of addiction, stress, anxiety, depression, and a whole host of other things, Hypnotherapy Unleashed is a platform that's completely free. It's on YouTube and you can go in there and we've got, I don't know, over 50 videos now specific to different niches. It's completely free. Uh, they range from sort of 15 to 20 minutes all the way up to an hour. Um, we use different music as well to help embed uh, the learning and really get the brain into different states. And so I think it's something that if you really do like breath work and you're, see you're searching for healing, then I think Hypnotherapy Unleashed would be a, a, an additional tool for your, your, your playlist belt. So, so please click on the link below and subscribe to that. We would really appreciate it as we're really trying to grow that channel. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. It's takeadeepbreath.co.uk. UK. Um, and if you could leave a comment, like, and I know not all of you are subscribed. So if you could subscribe below, that would be incredible. If you are listening to this on iTunes, if you could leave us a star review, a couple of stars, three stars, four stars, ideally five stars, that would be incredible because we're really trying to grow the podcast and get the word out there about conscious breathing. Now, it is my absolute honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Chris Ryan, PhD. So take it away. Here we go. Cheers. <sighs> Mr. Chris Ryan, thank you so much for being on the Take a Deep Breath podcast. It is an absolute pleasure to speak to you and uh, one of my dreams come true as well. Um, although I'm often reminded by something I think you said on the podcast a number of years ago, which I think you were talking about Brad Pitt and you said, the problem is they know that their shit stinks. Now I might be misquoting you a little bit, but I often, th <laughs> <laughs> I often think about that, about all these celebrities, but they know that their shit stinks. And there's, that's that piece, isn't it, around, um, we all kind of maybe start to think of ourselves, you know, I've become a bit of a podcaster, but actually I still know that I've got a lot of faults and problems. But anyway, I think this is gonna be quite a tangible podcast. Um, what I was hoping to do today with you, sir, is just talk about uh, a bit about your books, a bit about your background. I wrote a few questions down, but really the emphasis of today would be, I would just love to pick your brains a bit about what it means to live a life today uh, and your thoughts on what it means to live a good life 
and, and actually a good death as well. I was listening to the, the last bit of your, your book, uh, Civilized Death, again late, earlier, just to familiarise myself with some bits and these hermetically sealed caskets and all these things. So I'm just wanting to delve into all these different areas with you and uh, we'll see what we can get to in the next sort of 60 minutes. I guess my, my, my first question for you would be, how are you coping with uh, the pandemic and, and the lockdown situation? How's that been for you over the last sort of 12 months? Uh, well, I, I guess it's been pretty easy for me compared to to most people. I, you know, I don't have a job in the service industry that I've lost. Right? I, uh, I don't. I was working remotely from home anyway, mm. so that's not a shift. I don't have kids who are, you know, home from school that I have to deal with unexpectedly or you know scramble around for childcare. Yes. Um, you know, I uh, my mother's doing okay she's uh 80 years old and you know so she's my my main concern but she's fine i had started having um food delivered to her i i there's a guy named tyler as a friend of mine he has a company called um sun basket and he sponsored my podcast for a while and then as a way to you know sort of get to know the the service that i was talking about on the podcast i ordered the service for my mom and they deliver sort of like ready to cook meals, you know? Um, and we started that before the the whole pandemic started. So luckily that was already going. So she doesn't need to go to the grocery store and she's super happy just hanging out alone, you know, and I, I call her up. Um, so basically long, long story short, uh, my life was kind of already pretty much set up to deal with something like this. Yeah. So I feel um, very fortunate that I'm not dealing with you know, all the stressors and, um, and uh, economic uh, impact that a lot of people are, Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's not, you know, my one complaint is that I kind of like to um, spend the winters someplace tropical. And uh, this year, I wasn't able to do that for the first time in a few years. Um, and that's a bummer. Um, but, you know, come on, talk about first world problems, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. We, we, um, I've been always missing you. Not that we would have ever have had the chance to probably meet up, but I remember a couple of years ago, you were in South Africa and I'd, I'd just come back from there. And then I, I was in the in, in uh, Asia and I remember listening to your podcast. I know there's probably a delay in the podcast and I was like, oh, he was, he was so close again to me. And then I think you're in Spain a little bit, but no, I, um, so I've got a day job and I've got the, the take deep breath on the side and mm. I'm lucky that I've got this, this office and I do both things in, in this room. Um, but Talking, I want to get into your, your book, Civilized Death, a little bit. And obviously it came out before the pandemic. And, and I think I've been thinking, what have we evolved into now? Or what's the next step here? Because I'm, I'm very lucky. I've not really been affected by the pandemic. I've got my day job. I'm, I'm doing this on the side. I've got a lovely house that I get to be in. It's safe and secure and very comfortable. But I don't spend my time with any other humans all day. I'm in this box mm. by myself all day, talking to people on the screen. When I had my day job before... I used to have meetings for ninety percent of my working day, and I'd be, you know, mid management level talking to different people, eye to eye, person to person, shaking hands, sometimes a hug, depending on how well we get together. But now I sit in this room and I stare at this screen at this distance now for sometimes ten hours a day, um, and it's starting to take its toll a, a little bit. And I'm thinking, is this the next step of civilized evolution where we're too scared to mingle anymore, and this becomes the new norm? So I'd love to just get your thoughts on some of that yeah well so many in so many ways what we're going through now i think has accelerated pre-existing trends right and so social isolation um, the fragmentation of extended families and community and and these are all things that i wrote about in civilized to death um you know the, the sort of shift from getting together with people that you meet in the course of your life uh, versus swiping on a dating app, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just very different ways of interacting um, that generally have sort of the trajectory has been away from community and into isolation. You know, more people live alone right now than have ever lived alone in the existence of our species yeah and that's uh taking uh, a very dramatic effect on our mental health you know depression is way up and this is all before the pandemic so i'm, I'm just talking about what was already happening yes um 
you know, ordering on Amazon rather than going to the store, you know, it's, it's just, so, so yeah, it, it does seem that this particular pandemic has an ex is an accelerant to these trends. And, um, but in another way, I feel like maybe this is an opportunity to get the pendulum swinging the other way. So for example, I'm in a very small town right now in Colorado, where uh, 10 years ago, the population was probably maybe a fifth of what it is right now, because a lot of people are coming here. The real estate market's going crazy. Uh, people are building here. Now I'm talking like I'm in the middle of nowhere, mm. but people are coming out here because they want clean air, because they're set free yeah. by remote working, right? Yeah. They're set free by the realization that they can sell their house in uh, Dallas or Denver or, or LA uh, and get a similar uh, structure here for a fifth of the cost, much higher quality of life, beautiful dark skies at night, you know, nature all around. Quality of life is no longer tied to a particular place. And so people are starting to learn, uh, what's the phrase, uh, you know, arbitrage, international arbitrage, or, you know, you, you make your money one place and you spend it in a place where it's mm. worth more. You've done that traveling, I'm sure. So I, I think it's, you know, as always, there's a, a it's a double-edged sword, these things, you know, we can, we can find ways to put them to good use and use them as motivation. I think a lot of people are starting to look at the American dream and see, or the British dream or the French dream or wherever you are and see that uh, it's not generationally, we're not going to have as much money as our parents, yeah. we're not going to have as much financial security. So what do we do about that? Well, one, one thing that people are doing is getting together with their friends and saying, Hey, why don't we take care of each other? Because the state isn't going to take care of us. Right. This, yeah. so I, I, on my podcast, I talk about setting up lifeboats because the ship is sinking, right? Mm -hmm. The ship of state is going down. So we need to take care of each other and take care of ourselves. So, you know, if you, I have friends who are, who are coming here to, to live with us. And the idea being that, you know, we have friend, we have a, a very close friend who's an auto mechanic. And so he knows how to fix things and his wife takes care of chickens and, you know, this other guy's a carpenter. And so everybody's got a skill yeah. and we share tools and we, you know, we're going to all go work on his house uh, next week. And then the week after we're going to work on someone else's house. So we're saving money. Yeah. Uh, so it sort of set up your own community, your own barter system, your own um, extended family or tribe or, you know, hunter gatherer band or whatever your, uh, the, however you frame it. The point is that we, as a species, thrive on uh, cooperation and community and sharing, and the 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 pull of society is pulling us away from the very things that make us happy and healthy. So that's what my work is about. That's what Civilized to Death is about, largely. And Sex at Dawn is is sort of the same message, but in a more uh, intimate context, I guess. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. I've heard you talk about this this lifeboat, and funnily, actually, I think you had a one of your video um, chats where you put the audio on your podcast, and somebody was asking where they should set their lifeboat up, and one of the places they're asking about was Poland, but they didn't speak the language. Now, funnily enough, my girlfriend is Polish, and we live here in in England at the minute. I love Poland. They've got beautiful mountains. It's a good economy for you know, especially if if, you, if you're British. Um, and there's things out there which I just don't see in England. They they pickle. My, my girlfriend's mum pickles her own pickles. You know, we don't do that here um her grandma grows vegetables still she's like 89 90 and she's got like a big garden of stuff and she's you know active doing that sort of thing whereas here it's a very it's probably similar to america it was very much a supermarket culture the garden is nothing you know it's a tiny bit of, of grass so it i have these dreams of being able to get away from where we are and getting into a more rounded society but i've i was gonna ask you this actually i struggle 
at the minute between, and this is not a great um, metaphor, but I see you as this great traveler and you've inspired me so much. So I went traveling, met Wim Hof, and we can talk a bit about some of that stuff. But then on the, and it's not extreme pole opposites, but then I also look at Joe Rogan and there's this guy that seems to scra- cram everything in. And I think you've said before when you were talking about Elon Musk, I think, and you're like, we look at you, Joe, and say, how do you get all these things done in one day? You know, all these different things he's done. And I struggle on that bar between which side should I be and right now I'm leaning more towards the Joe Rogan and it's only prepping for this um, interview where I've thought I've lost my way a little bit because if I go back to a year year and a half ago I was traveling we were staying in hostels we were living off you know a couple of pounds a couple of dollars a day trying to live as cheap as we could and I've got to this point now where I'm working two jobs working you know ridiculous hours a day trying to get the business going here and stuff and meet all these great people and so I would just love to get your thoughts have you bounced between the scale of you and Joe a little bit because I guess you've had books go out there and you've done all these things or has your core uh, always been the Chris Ryan core of I'm gonna have a beer at the end of the night because I need to relax and look at the stars and all that romantic stuff yeah it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to talk about and think about. Um, you know, I love Joe. He's, he's someone I really admire. Uh, and I've gotten to know him personally and, and, you know, uh, I have nothing bad to say about that guy. Um, but I do feel like people like him are, you know, we talk about people who are driven mm. and I think that there's something underlying that drive that is not necessarily pleasant. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get in psychoanalyze Joe or anybody else, but I feel like the natural state of a human being is relaxed and ambition is a very dangerous, addictive drug because when you're, ambitious in an external sense you're ambitious for fame or for money or you know any kind of achievement um then you become dependent upon the feedback that you get for that achievement and your happiness depends upon uh achieving Mm. and whatever it is that you have decided is, is your path of achievement that path is going to come to an end or it's going to run into, um, you know, difficulties. For example, I used to live, you probably heard me talk about when I lived in this mansion with all these fashion models, right? So here are people who have largely um, sort of based their self-worth on their beauty and how much they can monetize that beauty. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you get to be, 25 or 30 and that beauty starts to fade then who are you Mm. right then you have a crisis because you've externalized your self-worth um and so i think that's always a mistake and it's something that i have always instinctively been very wary of Mm. so you know when i was young and people would you know professors or whatever would say man you should be a writer you're a good writer my First instinct was, no, I don't want to get into this um, sort of chasing success. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have anything to say. Why? The only reason I would write at this stage in my life when I'm 25 or whatever I was, 20, is is for attention. Mm -hmm. And making myself hungry for that attention weakens me, right? So so the things that I found, you know, you can be ambitious for internal growth. And I think that's, that's the way um, wisdom lies, you know, and and what I love about Joe is like, yeah, Joe gets a lot done. Joe's a stand up comic. Joe's, you know, making a ton of money. And, and he's, you know, but I think if you talk to Joe about his most important successes, he would say it's being a good father, it's being a good man, being a good husband. Um, I think you know, being a good friend, certainly. Um, and so the other stuff is sort of, it comes along with that. But I, I don't admire Joe because he's rich or famous. I admire Joe because he's a good friend and yes. he's a good person. So I think that kind of ambition makes sense. But don't locate your self-worth outside in your money or your fame or whatever, because that's all bullshit. 
Yeah. And that's, you know, getting back to Brad Pitt's shit. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that's the key that the people who um, become famous and get a lot of this admiration and, you know, attention um, that sort of sets them up in, in an imposter syndrome situation where they know they're just people. They're just, yeah. I'm just a dude, right? I'm just a guy. And, you know, in Brad Pitt's case, it's like, okay, I'm super good looking, but what did I do for that? It's not like I worked really hard to get this jawline, mm -hmm. you know, he knows that. Um, and to the extent that he forgets that he will start to get crazy mm -hmm. because it sets up a conflict between what he's pretending to be and what he knows he is. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we see this in people who rise, you know, some people become famous and they handle it and other people become famous and they fall apart. Um, and I think in many cases, the people who fall apart are the people who haven't resolved the conflict between what they're being told they are and what they know they are. Mm. That's, that's, it almost hit me with a bit of a wet fish there when you said that, because a lot of that stuff resonated a lot. And I, th I think about, are you familiar with David Goggins? Yeah, I, I, I know who he is. And I know he has a book called like, nothing can hurt me or something yeah. like that. And I know he's, I think he's the friend of Joe's, or he, at least mm. he's been on Joe's podcast. I haven't listened to it. But I, I do think about that. Um, because I see someone, you know, these, I've, I've got a buddy who's a Navy SEAL and, you know, I, uh, I, I know some of these, you know, um, bi life hackers, biohackers, you yeah. know, everything's optimal and, you know, functioning at the absolute highest level and they're, you know, Iron Man triathletes <laughs> and all this shit. And, and, you know, I always feel like I, I feel a little sad um for people and, and again i don't mean this about david goggins because i don't know him personally mm -hmm. at all but but people who are setting themselves up as being invulnerable mm -hmm. are i think that's the wrong path you embrace your vulnerability mm -hmm. you don't pretend there is none you are you know i don't care how tough you are how strong you are how much you work out how many vitamins you take and how, you know, your fiber content, you're going to get old. You're going to get yeah. fucking sick. You're yeah. going to die. Deal with that. Yes. Get ready for that. And to the extent that all this, you know, working out and, and, and the, this attention to the physical is a denial of these immutable realities of biological life these people are just setting themselves up for much more pain down the road. Yeah. Um, so, you know, nothing can hurt me. Fuck off. Of course things can hurt you. <laughs> yeah. A, I don't care how tough you are as a human being, any weak ass bear can take you, right? Like yeah. <laughs> you're not, a, humans are not a particularly impressive species. No. The fastest human is way slower than the slowest leopard, you know, like forget about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, if our teeth are ridiculously dull. We've got no claws. We're not very <laughs> coordinated. Any chimpanzee can, you know, take out four Joe Rogans and David Goggins. So yeah. um, I just think there's the humility is an acceptance are, uh, are more likely to lead to happiness and, um, and the kind of growth that, that is really going to be worth something over the long run. And in fact, Joe and I talked about this, I think the last time I was on his podcast, um, cause he was sort of making fun of me cause I don't work out a lot. And then I was making fun of him cause he works out too much. <laughs> and, you know, we, we were sort of playing with that theme. And uh, I remember that he wrote an essay. I, I don't remember if it was in men's health or one of those magazines and it was really interesting because the essay was that your body is like a sand painting mm. and you can spend uh, lots of time working on your body, but you're still going to get old and you're still going to die. It's still going to break down. It's still temporary. Yeah. And I was really happy to see someone like Joe um, spreading that message you know, that you're not going to avoid these things. Mm. I think a lot of what's going on right now in Silicon Valley with, um, you know, this life extension 
frenzy. There's lots of money, hundreds of millions, yes. maybe billions of dollars going into this stuff. Uh, Aubrey Dubray, I think his name is, mm -hmm. uh, um, is one of the leading thinkers in that area. I mean, they're, they're, selling this idea that that you're going to stop aging and that people are going to live forever. Yeah. This is just nonsense. This this is the same snake oil that's been sold for centuries. It and instead of trying to live forever, try to live today. Yeah. You know, instead of trying to extend you know there there are, there are two dimensions. There's the dimension of of length and there's the dimension of depth and I think to the extent that we're obsessed on the length of our lives and we lose sight of focusing on the depth of our lives, mm -hmm. I think this is a mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I was listening to your, your, your death chapter. Uh, I don't know if it's called that, but the chapter where you talked a lot about death and, and civilized death and the extension. And I can't remember the exact figures, but a ridiculous percentage in America of the Medicare costs go towards the final weeks and months. And I'd forgotten that. And it was just shocking listening to that, that today. And I don't think we have quite the same problem here in England. We've got the NHS and stuff, but there, there, there is definitely that element of let's keep that person as live as long as we can, because anything other than that is, is a defeat. And yet I had to put my dog down a few years ago and I was being humane. And so there's that weird contradiction going on there. Where do yeah. you, where do you get your, what, what, where do you get your death philosophy thinking from? Because I, I see you as something that's like, do you know what? I'm going to die one day and that's okay. And I've had a really good life and, and um, that, that's okay. And don't give me any CPR. Don't keep me plugged into any machines. And, and I, when I hear that, part of me is like, yeah, I want to be with Chris on that. But another part of me is going, yeah, but if you can maybe keep me alive a bit longer, there's always a chance I might get better. And so it's that weird dichotomy that I have there. So be, yeah, where does that come from for you? Because it feels like you've got quite a really healthy acceptance of death. Uh, I, you know, I think it comes from several different places and it has been reinforced through experience. So the the first place it comes from and i don't know if i've talked about this publicly before but when i was really young um i remember having a sense that where i came from like on a cosmic level before i was born was a really good place mm -hmm. really comfortable and happy and blissful I'm talking when I was nine, 10, 11 years old, something like that. And then as my sort of verbal brain or mind started to dominate the nonverbal aspects of my consciousness, I remember having this sense that I am losing this memory and, and it's a memory that's going to be really important for me to have later in my life. And so what I, I can't, I can't stop losing it because I'm losing the connection, the sort of direct connection that I had with that state of consciousness. Um, but I need to sort of like build a, a monument in my brain to this so that I will remember that I once remembered this. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, it's almost like I, I want to take a photo of this thing that is fading so that I'll have the photo, yeah. even though I won't have the memory itself, I'll have the photo of the memory and I can refer to that mm -hmm. later. And so it, it's one of my earliest memories, this idea like, don't worry about dying because you know, when you die, you just go back to where you were before you were born. And I remember that where I was before I was born was great. So chill, enjoy yourself, right? Yeah. Don't spend your life worrying about it because it's fine. So I, I had that memory and then I sort of lost the memory, but I had the memory of the memory. Mm -hmm. And then the first time I did psychedelics, which was uh, mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, Halloween night, 1980, I was... 18 years old, I guess, my first year in college. And the, I had this overwhelming sense of familiarity when I was tripping, like, wow, okay, it's the first time I've ever done this, but this feels so familiar to me, like, yeah. 
like this is reality and the rest of it is an act or or a you know a, a diluted version of this and um and one of the one aspect of it was this lack of fear of death mm. and so um you know as i used psychedelics uh subsequently um part of what i was exploring there and and sort of um reinforcing was this um consciousness this posture of consciousness where i am going my purpose here is to enjoy life to to savor life to to be grateful for this life and not to lose that focus by worrying about it the fact that it's transitory in some way which i saw all around me people were doing right yeah. people were were not enjoying themselves because they were so worried about losing this thing that they were were not enjoying anyway it was like whether well, you're missing the whole point here you know and then i remember i did a vipassana uh one of those 10 day silent retreats mm -hmm. in spain and i i the teaching was about you know enjoying something it was about this it was about how do you enjoy something without clinging to it right one of the central teachings of buddhism is about this how do you enjoy something without then wanting to preserve it forever and hold on to it and you know and thereby strangle it in many cases um and i was walking by myself out in this field behind the the place where we were doing the meditation and it was at night and I was thinking about this and I looked up and a shooting star went down through the sky and I was like, wow, wow, cool. And then it was gone. And then I realized like, I'm not bummed out that it's gone. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just bathing in gratitude that it, it ever happened at all. Right. Yeah. That I got to see that. And so that sort of became a, you know, a recurring image in, in my mind, like this, you know, if you are worried about preserving life too much and you're too scared of death, then you're the person who doesn't really even see the shooting star because the second the it starts to fall, you're like, oh, no, it's going to end. It's going to end. It's going to end. Yeah. Oh, I knew it would end. Like you just wasted the whole fucking experience. Yeah. Man. So anyway, I don't know. I mean, that that it's always been a theme, obviously, because, you know, I think. um life is enriched um by understanding and keeping death near yeah and then of course i worked in hospitals in spain for a long time um i was doing research with uh oncologists for years so i i, I was around a lot of people who were in the process of dying and mm. doctors who worked with uh, a lot of people who died um and then I, you know, was married to a doctor for 20 years. And, um, you know, so a lot of the people I spent time with were around death and it, it yeah. was, um, you know, not a taboo subject. And then my father died uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. And, um, you know, that's been a, that's unavoidably uh, an important transition, I think, for anybody and I'll tell you, I feel like the grieving process for my father has been um, very much uh, lightened by my knowledge of the fact that he enjoyed his life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if I, if my father had sacrificed his own happiness you know, had, had been really unhappy in some terrible job that he didn't like or married to a woman he didn't love or, you know, if he had missed the opportunity to live his life, I yeah. think I would grieve. I, the weight of his death would, would weigh on me much more heavily. So, you know, by living your life fully and happily and really savoring it, you're actually doing a favor for people who love you. Because when you die, they're going to say, you know what? Hey, Mike had a good run, you know, yeah. let's raise a toast yeah. to him and, you know, have a good night. And like, 
as opposed to poor Mike, you know, mm. poor Mike, he never really got off the ground. He never really went anywhere. He mm. never did what he wanted to do. That's sad. But someone who lived a good life, you know, there's nothing sad in the ending. Yeah. Quality over quantity. But we it's so easy to focus on the quantity, isn't it, over the quality. And um, I, I try to have gratitude. And, and it's so easy for it to, to just fall three fingers. It's like, I've got eyes, I've got ears, I can walk, I can communicate, I've got an education. Uh, and I, I try and journal these things now and again. Uh, and when I'm in the mode, it's like, oh, this is great. And I can feel a bit of gratitude. But then you, something random happens in your day-to-day civilized life and it just throws you out of whack. And it's something so silly. Um, and, and yes, he's a good example of, of what you're talking about. So I had so much work to do for, for Take a Deep Breath. And I was like, I need to crack on. And we've just got a new puppy, a little German Shepherd, which we brought back from Poland. And uh, lo- lovely, but also destructive as anything. Um, and um, every she just wants to eat things that don't belong to her. If I panned the camera down now, now, all you would see here is cardboard that she was in just before I hit record. Um, anyway, I, l- I love it well, a bit. You've invited a wolf into your house, yeah, man. Yeah, like, what do have. you think's going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I had, my previous dog was uh, just a little lap dog, and, and it was lovely. And um, uh-huh. uh, and this one is a wolf. Yeah, a- absolutely. But but yes, yeah, my, my girlfriend's like, right, we should go to the, there's a big national park nearby. She goes, we should go there for a couple of hours. It was snowing. I said, like, I haven't really got time for that. She goes, come on, let, let's go. And, and I got out, and it was snowing, and Dog was loving it. It's the first time I've been to this national park. And it was the highlight of my day yesterday. I didn't give a sure. crap about all the other stuff. And it's like, if the only thing that happened yesterday was going for the walk, it was a good day and it was a good day. But I would have easily sacrificed that for cracking on with all of this this work stuff. So I don't know what the answer to that is. It's taking more time out, I guess, and, and thinking more about, like you just said, how, how, does, how does Mike or how does Chris or how does anybody have that, have that good life? And how do you catch yourself? I don't know if you have any suggestions here, but it's easy to get seduced by comfort and the ego. And it's like, how can you, and, and when you're in it, you don't notice sometimes, do you? But maybe you're better trained in this, but how, any advice, how you can catch that and go, hang on a second, the ego's taken over a little bit here. I need to slow down a little bit. Yeah, it- I mean, for some people, a meditation practice is is an important part of that. I think that's one reason that people um, value meditation, because it's a time where you turn off all that stuff and you um, focus on what is ego, what is the voice of the ego talking to you. Mm -hmm. I I think any experience that you have that um, reduces life down to its essentials isn't enlightening in that respect. So for example, I, I try to spend three or four months every year living in my van. Right. And, you know, it's amazing. Like, uh, you know, my friend and I spent, I think it was four months this past summer in the van and we've got all this stuff in a storage locker. and, And I said to her, like, is there anything in that storage locker that you've missed in the last four months? She was like, no, I was like, me either. Like, why we're paying all this money for all this crap in the store? We, we don't, obviously, we don't need it. We've just lived great for four months, yeah, without that stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, now we did not burn down the storage locker, the, the you know, we got a lot of that <laughs> stuff still. Uh, but the point is that you know, build into your life these reminders of what really matters, I guess, is is my point. Yeah. So whether it's, re- and it's always a reduction, right? It's never an adding. You don't need to buy anything. You need to get rid of stuff or have, um, you know, live your life in a way that you don't need those things. Um, so, you know, camping, I think is, is a great one. Uh, you know, just going for a long walk with your dog, having a dog. I think that's one of the reasons that people have pets is like, mm-hmm. You know, you see this animal, it's like, that animal is so damn happy. You give him a new box to rip up and he's like just pure happiness for a while, you know? And I think that's one of the sources of insight is being around uh, non-human animals or children, right? Mm -hmm. Like seeing what makes that five-year-old kid happy. It's not the iPad, it's, it's being outside, it's running, it's, you know, doing cartwheels, it's running into the ocean or a lake or, you know, swinging on a rope. It's very simple things. And to the extent that we get away from those things, I think, you know, again, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We think we're being sophisticated and, you know, people think 
that they're superior when they need a higher, um, when it takes more to make them happy. So I, I think in Civilized to Death, I talked about this in terms of wine, right? Mm -hmm. Like I lived in Spain for a long time and I drank a lot of wine in Spain and I found that I was very happy with like my favorite wines cost about 10 euros a bottle right? That's mm -hmm. the sweet spot for me. Now I have friends, we go over for dinner and they pull out this wine. It costs 80, 90, a hundred euros a bottle. Yeah. And I drink it. And it's like, I honestly don't notice the difference and I don't want to, mm. right? Because I don't want to have to earn a hundred euros to buy a bottle of wine that will make me happy. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have this super refined taste. I want my taste to be pretty damn simple so yeah. that I can just enjoy things that I can afford rather than having to work harder to get things that will bring me pleasure, you know? Yeah. So I think we shoot ourselves in the foot that way. You know, someone who's like, you know, like I, I've dated women who, when I said something about, you know, uh, living in a hut on a beach in Thailand, you can see them sort of go like, Oh my God, no, that's not for me. <laughs> and it's like, okay, deal breaker, you know, cause there's no way that I'm going to try to make you happy by spending a thousand dollars a night in some resort. That's yeah. just not going to happen. Yeah. You know? So I think keeping our tastes very basic and, you know, think about it in culinary terms, like fresh vegetables that are lightly cooked with a little olive oil, Mm. taste the vegetable don't mm. bury it in cheese sauce or you know some something that buries the flavor of the experience itself yeah. so i don't know i'm talking a lot and saying very little no, it's basically it's good. everything boils down to quality over quantity yes. right it's yeah. it's all about enjoy the experience itself and don't be distracted by the nonsense and of course the nonsense is generated by a capitalist system that wants us to keep buying things. It's mm -hmm. trying to enslave us. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important that we learn to ignore the messages that are coming at us from this system and learn to focus our attention on the messages that are coming to us from the natural world and from within ourselves, which are in concert in telling us that simplicity and love and, you know, kindness and a campfire and looking at the stars or the sunset or the sunrise, these are the things that make us happy, mm -hmm. not the latest iPhone and gadgets and things that cost lots of money. Yeah. We, 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 when I was married um, and we moved house, we had so much stuff and in the attic, not not the house, but the attic, there was thirty boxes of stuff, um, and that was a that was a really dark time because the marriage was kind of ending, and and there's all this stuff everywhere. Anyway, fast forward a little bit. Um, me and my girlfriend went traveling um, back end of 2018, and we sold the bed, we sold the car, um, and we and we put about four boxes of stuff into my parents' attic, and that's all that we had between us. And I couldn't even now tell you what was in there, just, you know, spatulas and things that you don't really want to buy again when you started, or some cutlery or something. But but it yeah. was it was such a great feeling to be getting to, you know, getting to nearly 40, but having nothing really, and knowing that that was okay, because you're going to, you know, you don't need it to have a great, like, we had a great, you know, year traveling, and none of me was going, oh, I'm a bit worried about, the stuff because there's no need to worry about it. it's just baggage weighing me down so yeah. as i've then come back and re-entered society i'm really trying to think very carefully i'm not i'm not a minimalist at all but i try and think very carefully about what's this purchase going to do is it going to weigh me down am i going to have to service that car now because i've owned it and is it just going to cause more problems and can i get the bus or mm. the bike and and that sort of thing um i want to talk to you a bit about spain actually because you just you brought spain up have, have you ever done part to all of the camino i heard you mention it before uh, no, I've been to, you know, I've been to a lot of places along it, um, but I've never walked it. Mm. No, it's, it, it's right up your street. And I'm sure you've done things very similar to it. But um, I, I read a book before I went and the guy, the author described it as it's a life within a life. And I love this term. And he goes, and as you know that you're getting to the end, um, you know that the inevitable death is coming of that life. And, and at the mm. very start of it, you, you, you're by yourself. And I went by myself. 
Um, and then I made some friends and made some really good friends and we were a little gang and then we kind of went off in our own directions halfway through and it really did feel like well I'm a teenager now I'm middle aged now I'm getting towards the end and then mm. there was that inevitable death where we all went off and we were mm. from all over the planet and yes we've got Facebook but we all went back to our corners of the planet again um, and that was such a, a transformative time for me um, it's but, but knowing that there was that death at the end, fast, fast forward into after the travel, um, I kind of had this sense, and I think you've spoke about this a little bit today, I kind of got to this point without being morbid, where I was going, it's okay if I die now. And it's it was the weirdest feeling I got. And I don't necessarily feel that today, but when I got back from traveling and Wim Hof and some of the bits we might talk about later, I just kind of got to this point going, that's okay. I, I feel like I've not done enough, but going back to your, your analogy about the funeral or, you know, the person's had a good life, I kind of feel that at 40, like the rest of it's gravy for me now. It doesn't matter what really mm. happens next. But then on the fast forward again a little bit to now, the ego's taking control again. It's going to know, but you need to work harder. You need to get some money in the bank. You need to get some more possessions. You need to get a nice car. So um, I feel like today's podcast has been very apt for me because talking to you, it's been a, a little bit of a reset. I'm going to have to go back and, and re-listen to this again. But is there any other advice or wisdom that you can give, uh, maybe from your traveling days that has, has stayed with you and kept you grounded now? Because I know you've been to India and I can't imagine what that must have been like in sort of the 80s and 90s. Was the things that you saw in your travels that have kind of shaped more who you are today that you can reference? Oh, man, that's a huge question. Um, you know, I traveled all through my 20s and most of my 30s, mm. um, you know, depending how we define travel. I, I lived in Spain through my 30s and 40s, pretty much, you know, quite a bit of traveling in there as well. Um, you know, you know, the, there, yeah, there's so many things. The, the first major trip that I did was I was in university and I found a loophole in the way that the university was set up that I could basically skip a year and still graduate uh, on time and save my parents a bunch of money because uh, they were paying the bill. And um, so I, I went to the administration and I said, look, uh, you know, according to this, I've done this and that. And so I don't really need to be here. And they're like, what? That can't be. And they, they looked at it and they were like, oh, oh damn, you're right but then they immediately changed everything. So no one else could do it, but mm -hmm. I skipped my junior year, my third year in university. And I thought, okay, well, I've got a year off. I need to be back here next year, but I've got this year off. So what should I do? And I, I always wanted to go to a frontier. Like at that time I was reading uh, uh, Herman Melville and Joseph Conrad and all these sort of adventure literature, you know, kind of, both spiritual and physical, you know, journeys. Mm. Um, and so I thought, okay, I want to go to Alaska because mm. that's the frontier. That's like where I can actually get to the edge of the civilized world a little bit. Right. And going to the Amazon or something, or, or, you know, somewhere in Africa was, that was outside of my realm of imagination at that point. Um, and also finances. Cause my parents agreed they would give me, the money that I was spending on food in the university um, to fund my my travels if nice. I wanted to go somewhere. But that wasn't a lot, right? It was a few hundred bucks a month or something. So I decided to hitchhike to Alaska. And, you know, I was, you know, not to talk about ego. I had a lot of ego at that point in my life. I was a really good student. I was friends with the professors. I was winning all these awards. I was you know, on this track to go to actually to Oxford, because I had a professor who was a big shot at Oxford, and he was going to pull some strings, and I was going to go to Oxford and do a PhD and be, you know, get tenure and blah, blah, blah. So I had this, this sort of path set out of my life. And I took this year and I went to Alaska and I hitchhiked from New York to Alaska, which is I don't even know, 1500 miles or uh, it's, it's a lot. It, oh, yeah. It's across North America. And that was very strange because that, that was, um, you know, in the sixties and seventies, people hitchhiked, but by the eighties, nobody was really hitchhiking anymore. It was, 
you were hitchhiking because you just got out of prison and didn't have any money. <laughs> you know, you were schizophrenic or th there weren't like a lot of people like me hitchhiking. The okay. hippie thing was all done. Right. Um, so I met a lot of really interesting characters hitchhiking people that I never would have met in my fancy university, mm. you know, or the suburbs where I grew up. Um, and some of the people that I met uh, were really smart, but in ways that I, their intelligence manifested in ways that I had never really seen before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm talking, so I'm coming from a place where I'm hanging out with everybody's got PhDs, everyone's IQ is off the charts, you know, they went to Yale and Harvard and Princeton and all these places and super, super smart. Um, but they didn't know how to do anything. Their relationships were a mess. You know, they didn't know how to change a light bulb mm. or, you know, fix the air conditioner. They always had to call somebody and a lot of sort of class arrogance, you know, mm. um, looking down at the working class, you know, these poor people who you know, never don't know who Nietzsche is or, you know, wouldn't know a Beethoven symphony from a Brahms lullaby, you know, it's like... And then I'm, I'm with these people who pick me up. I remember this one guy in particular, he picked me up in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in, in the Yukon territory, I think in, in Canada. And he took me to his house and, you know, he had built the house himself and it was this beautiful log cabin and his wife and kids were there and they were really cool and they really loved him. And he had a bunch of dogs that were, they were like half Alaskan Malamute and half wolf because he used wow. them as sled dogs and he was breeding them. And these dogs were awesome. And he had a big garden and I think they had chickens. I don't remember, but they were like really self-sufficient and, you could tell they loved each other and respected mm. each other. And he had this, you know, it's just like, dude, your life is awesome. And you know how to fix your car. You know how to build this, you know, know how to, you know, hunt and butcher an animal to feed mm. your family. And, and I just remember thinking like this guy is so far from the world that I've been living in. And he has accepted me. And then he gave me a ride back out to the highway the next day, like an hour drive, you know, nice. and um, he has accepted me into his world with all this generosity and kindness. But if this guy fell into my world, if this guy, you know, ended up at the university and my friends wouldn't accept him, they mm -hmm. wouldn't be kind to him. They wouldn't invite him into their world. And I realized like, I'd rather be like this guy than like those professor friends of mine. Mm. And, uh, and I, I, I realized like I'm on the wrong path. Like I'm operating out of ego. I'm mm. operating out of like, I'm going to be another, um, you know, talking about um, imposter syndrome, right? I'm going to be, another one of these professors who's talking about these books that are all about experiences that I've never had. Yes. And I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be lying to kids, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or transmitting someone else's experiences. I want to have my own experiences. I want to have my own life. And so that summer in Alaska, I, uh, I reconfigured my life and I, I said, okay, I'm not going to grad school. I'm not committing to a job or a career or a woman or anything else until I'm 30. Mm. And I am going to spend at least a decade floating around the world, having experiences before I make any commitments to anything or anyone. And I'll lose 10 years. Like if I decide, oh, actually I want to be a surgeon. Well, I'm going to be applying to med school at 30 instead of at 20, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I'll be behind, but whatever it is I decide to do, I'm confident that I'll be better at it for having spent this 10 years exploring the world. Wow. Um, I remember there was a, an image, there was an essay by the poet Robert Frost where he, he uses the image, he says, uh, 
he was talking about a poem, but I applied it uh, to life. But he says, uh, a poem, like a piece of ice on a hot grill, a poem must ride its own melting. Mm. And I thought, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to ride my own melting. And just see where life takes me when I, you know, like riding a horse, I want to let go of the reins and just see where this horse wants to go, you know? And so that's what I did. And, you know, it's led to here, but I, I think, you know, getting back to your question, like what have I seen on travels that I guess I saw the, the incredible power of surrender, right? You can't travel at least you can't travel well if you know where you're going. Mm. The best way to travel is where you don't know where you're going yeah. and you're not trying to control what happens. Like I never book a room before I get there, you know, like, yeah. you know, cause I, when I've done that, I've always found like, Oh man, I wanted to go to this other place. Yeah. I found this other place better. Or I wanted to leave earlier cause I met these people and they offered to take me to their, you know, place out on the beach, but I've got this room, I've already paid for it. It's just, you know, that kind of security um, really interferes with the experience. And so, you know, you can look at that on a micro level in terms of particular travel techniques or look at it in a macro level in terms of how do you live your life? Mm. I like to keep as much undefined as possible and just sort of, you know, uh, adapt to things as they happen. And yeah. I find that when you approach life that way, a lot more good things tend to happen. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. When we um, we got to the Philippines first on our travels and we planned out every single day. And by the end of that month, we were exhausted. I'd never felt exhaustion <laughs> like it. And we just spent like a week on the beach somewhere, I think it's Boracay. Um, but then after that, we, we went we went rogue and we just, we were just, where should we go next? And there's a lovely thing you've said in the past, which by the way, before I say, um, it, it's so weird, isn't it? When you, I mean, I'm, I'm 1% of where you are as a podcaster, but when people quote things back to you that you've said, and you don't actually know the person, it's such a bizarre thing. Like I had a podcast with somebody a little while ago and she goes, oh yeah, like you said before about your back's bad. And I was like, how does she know that? I've never said that to her before. It's a, it's a, it's a very strange thing. Obviously you, you'll get it tenfold, but, um, I would go and stay in hostels because I think you said that's where you get the greatest interactions. And it was so true. Whenever we stayed in nice hotels, you wouldn't speak to anybody. Nobody wants to talk to you. You have a meal by yourself. It's all very clinical. You've got your clinical room. I stayed in places where I had ants in the bed. And, you know, we stayed in the Hello Miss Kitty room in the Philippines. There's Hello nice. Miss Kitty everywhere. <laughs> it was ridiculous. It was all pink and there's ants everywhere. But do you know what? It was, it was, it was wonderful. It was like $10 for the night um, for two yeah. people. Um, and we've got little motorbikes for $5. Anyway, it was the best. And there's something you said, which is traveling is when you're counting how many days you've been away and a vacation oh, is how many right. days you've got left. And I was like, right. that, that was it. Cause I was like, oh, how long have we been going for now? I've been going for like four months. Oh, we can keep going, you know, but whereas you go on a two week vacation, got 10 days left, six days left. And it puts this horrible pressure on you where A, you can't enjoy it. Cause if you've been away for a year or 10 years or 20 years, how can you have it? you know, a two week vacation where you really want to do what you want to do in six months. Um, but yeah, that was an interesting mind shift for me, this counting up versus counting down again. Um, right. And you can apply that to our earlier conversation about death. Yeah. Right. So many people are counting down. How mm-hmm. much time do I have left? Mm-hmm. Right. As opposed to, man, I can't believe, I mean, I, I was just talking to a friend about this the other day. We, we're, you know, because I think because I've lived in different parts of the world it's really um sort of intuitive to like i had a life in spain i had a life in new york i had a life in san francisco Mm -hmm. i had a life in vancouver and portland and you know like those are all lives they're sets of friends sets of experiences you know and uh yeah it's it's i mean i'm 58 now i'll be 59 in a few days and uh I feel like I've lived a dozen lives. That's great. You know, I mean, I maybe when I'm, you know, when I get the diagnosis, I'll have a panic of like, oh my God, but I haven't, you know, Mm -hmm. had enough time. I I don't know what will happen if that comes to pass, but 
but I do feel like, man, I've had so many lives. I can't believe I can still walk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my friend, uh, he, I think he found the term epoch. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but it's like, I think it's another word for era and there's all these different mm. epochs. So for me, I've got my university life and the friendships that happened there and traveling and, and the Camino, very, very short life that happened with a very short group mm. of friends and stuff. And maybe that's one of the keys or successes to life is to have all, how many lives can you have within a life uh, without, with, because at the same time, it's like, is it important to put down roots? Yes, it is. It's important to have those strong friendships that see you through the rest of your life, I think. But then at the same time, it's good to go a little bit rogue from society and, and go off and do these these crazy things. Um, what be, I'm conscious of our time. So I just want to ask you a couple last questions, if that's okay. What, what What's sure. coming up for you? Have you got any... Because I remember um, in, in one of your podcasts, you're saying that civilized to death had almost become two books and so you were having to go one way with it and there was almost a second other book so is that still the case have you got anything on the back burner that's likely to come out yeah the, i've got a lot of things on the back burner um that's one of them but i i don't know that i really am ready to to do that book that you're referring to um because that's another like really big idea book and it will require a lot of reading and research and um yeah i don't know that i really want to jump into that again mm -hmm. uh i feel that uh i've got some other books that i'm i'm thinking about writing that are um uh not as as intensive and heavy okay um, so in fact, one of them relates to, to what we were talking about, uh, at the beginning, this approach to health that is, um, a sort of denial of mortality and biological reality. Mm -hmm. So I, I have this idea for writing a book that's more sort of an embrace of, uh, mortality and, uh, uh sort of shifting, attention to quality of life rather than obsessing over quantity of life and, and showing how that obsession over quantity not only robs us of quality because it distracts us from gratitude and, and depth of, of uh, experience, but also is actually counterproductive because the stress that it generates um, underlies a lot of the health problems that people have mm. you know so it's sort of a mediterranean uh i don't want to talk about it too much because okay. i found in the past that when i talk about books too much it, it drains the energy for actually mm. writing them um but I, that's that's something i've been thinking of and there are you know various things um you know travel tales and you know memoir kind of things but i get a lot of that um out on the podcast so yeah. it's it's nice to feel because you know i do feel like i've had experiences and i've met people that kind of um give me a a sense of responsibility in a way like i need to tell that story like mm -hmm. that story there's something in that that demands to be told and it would be helpful for people to hear it or like I've you know, met these characters, like, man, I can't just let them die and be forgotten. Like that, that person is so extraordinary. Like I need to record it somehow. And um, it's been nice doing the podcast to be able to um, tell some of those stories in a way that's more spontaneous and uh, organic to just yeah. sit down with a beer and talk into a microphone rather than, you know, pouring over a written thing for, mm -hmm weeks or months so that's nice um so i don't know I, I might you know i guess i'm in i'm in a position because of the success of the first two books where if i do write a third book um you know it'll likely be published and you know there'll be financial rewards attached to it mm -hmm. but uh, one of the problems of not being ambitious is that people can offer you a lot of money and it doesn't really matter, mm. you know? Um, or, you know, I had an, an editor uh, after, I think maybe it was after Sexaton came out and it was a, you know, it's in 35 languages and big bestseller and blah, blah, blah. And, and he was like, like, okay, you know, you can write a, 
why don't you, you know, write a, an op-ed for the New York Times and, you know, then we can get something placed in, you know, on CNN and we can do this. And you know, he put together this whole sort of media strategy and, you know, then I'll, you, we'll get you on, you know, Charlie Rose or, you know, whatever it was. And I was like, no, man, I'm, I'm going to Bali or wherever nice. it was. And, and, and he's like, well, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, you're, you're in the position now to do this. Do you know, like everyone wants to be where you are right mm -hmm. now. You can take advantage of this. And I was like, no, I just want to go chill. Like I, I'm tired. I've been mm -hmm. writing and editing and doing all these interviews. Like I'm done. And I remember he sort of looked at me with this confusion. He said, don't you want to be part of the national conversation? Mm -hmm. And I thought, Hmm, no, no, mm -hmm. really. I don't want to be part of the national conversation because I don't think it matters. I don't, you know, I think the world's going to do history is going to go where it's going to go. I'm not going to change that. Yeah. You know, so, so I went to Bali. Good for you. And what, what, what that <laughs> tells me is you, you've, you're somebody that's got that that knowing or that it's obviously got a strong moral compass. I'm trying to think of what the right words would be, but you know, your values and you're somebody, and I think that's the reason I think you've had so much success. One of the reasons is you're somebody that's got, this is me, this is my values. And, you know, 99 out of 100 people would have taken that deal or wanted to be part of that, that conversation, that national conversation, whereas you're the person going, do you know what? No, I know what's important to me. and I'm going to go the other way. And I, th and I think that is, yeah, it, it, I respect that so much. I'm not sure I would have made the same decision, but I would want to deep inside. Well, it's, it's interesting to, you know, cause I, it's sometimes those things come across to people as being like very principled or something, but from my perspective, it's, it's actually quite selfish. Mm. You know, it, it, I just want to do what feels good. Yes. And to me, what feels good is going to Bali and lying in a hammock and, you know, having fresh coconut and pineapple and being with the woman I love. And mm -hmm. like, that's what feels good. I've had, you know, I've seen the other side, right? Yeah. I've, I have friends who live on mega yachts and I've been on the yacht and, um, you know, I have friends who are super famous and hang out with Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. And I've, I've seen that world. I've been in that world and I'm not, um, I'm not, trying to insult anything or anyone, but honestly, it feels much better to be in a world where people aren't that obsessed with money or fame or power or getting to Mars or, you know, amassing fortunes or changing the world. It's just, it's more fun to chill out with people who are yeah. chill, yeah. you know? And it's a lot easier to enjoy life with people who are enjoying life. Yes. Yeah. And um, so I, I don't mean it as any sort of like, you know, guru wisdom. I just like, it's better. Mm. It's just better. And so from my perspective, it's totally selfish. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. Because, yeah, I, I would say it slightly differently. Have you ever heard of the, the author Robin Sharma? He wrote a book called The Monk That Sold the Ferrari or Sold His Ferrari. He also is fantastic. I only read it over Christmas and he tells these wonderful fables about how to have a great life. And he tells it in a fictional story. It's a wonderful book. He also wrote a second book called The 5am Club, which is also great. Um, but there's just a bit in there and, I, and I, this keeps coming back over and over again and everything. And, and it's just one of those things that keeps coming to me, which is to have a great life is a life of servitude and a life where you're helping mm. other people. And I don't know if this is, I'm misquoting you or somebody else here, but they, there's a story where if you give people a hundred dollars and say go make yourself feel better in america and england they spent it on themselves but in mm. the, in the east they would spend that money to help other people is that am i quoting you there is that something you've told before well i've talked about it for yeah. sure you know lots of other people have as yeah. well i mean you know when i'm writing about hunter gatherers or talking about hunter gatherers one of the important differences between hunter gatherer people and and you know those of us who came after is the importance of sharing, mm -hmm. you know, their entire society is built around sharing. I remember Charles Darwin told a story about uh, how he had, he was with um, some hunter gatherer people and he gave one of them a cigarette 
And there were like four or five of them standing around. And that guy immediately broke the cigarette into four little pieces and gave a piece to everybody. Yeah. So they're all trying to smoke these (laughs) tiny little cigarette nubs. And Darwin was like, you people are never going to advance because you don't understand accumulation of resources and Mm -hmm. power. And you need this hierarchy in order to advance. And of course, from Darwin's perspective, he was right. Mm -hmm. But from their perspective, it's like, why would you want to advance to a place where people don't have enough and don't share, mm. right? It's, it's a very different way of, one of my favorite expressions is um, the best place to store extra food is in your friend's stomach. Yeah, I love that. You know, yeah. and yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, we, we build these worlds that are based upon values that makes sense for an economy, but that don't make sense for us as individual homo sapiens. Mm. And then we wonder why we're not happy. Mm. You know, it's, it's like we're wearing shoes that are not shaped like a human foot. Yeah. It's not going to be comfortable. And yet we're trying to cram our feet into these strangely shaped shoes. Much better to go barefoot. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's true on another level, isn't it? Touching the earth. You know, that's a whole other subject I'm sure biohackers have talked a lot about, but you know, we don't touch the earth enough. And, and if you yeah. say that to somebody that doesn't really know much about that, they think, oh, that's a bit woo-woo. But then you think, well, actually, we're the only animal that's cut herself off from the planet. So I don't understand the magnetic reasons and all those other things. But w- mm. when you start to think about it, think, it feels good to have that sand or the water or the grass between my toes. Um, but yeah, oh, I, li- yeah. I, li- I like the shoe analogy. You're right. It's, it's these bad shoes. Um, last question for you, because I'm, I'm keen to wrap this up for you. Um, I've loved this, by the way. Um, you, your tomas are fantastic. And oh, they got me uh, to travel. And there was a quote like you said, something along the lines of um, it's a bit like a spaceship getting into space. Most of the energy is expelled trying to get you out. And when I was quitting, uh, when I was trying to quit my job, the amount of resistance I got, because I gave my boss nine months notice that I was going to quit my 15 year job. Because <laughs> I knew we wanted to go at the end of the year and I thought I want to earn between now and the end. So I gave an, I went to a Tony Robbins event. I, I visualized that I need to get out of that job of 15 years. I went in on the Monday, quit, but gave her the notice till Christmas. But the amount of resistance that I, I got there and I was like, oh my God. And I was almost begging for my job back several times. But then once we left, it was fantastic, you know, and, and then, you know, the rest is, is, is recent history. Um, and I, I think, how can I judge the success of my travels? And I think back to one of your Tomas, um, and I now have my own poo story. So when I heard your story <laughs> <laughs> about coming down, do you mind if I just tell it you quickly? Cause I've never, I've never shared it before. So, no, no, um, sure. so we, we'd, we'd, um, we'd got to the Philippines. It was our first destination in, in the East. And my belly's not good anyway. You know, it doesn't take much for it. I can look at a curry and I'll get sick. And I was, like, I was always worried about traveling anyway. So I had Pepto-Bismol, tablets, liquid. <laughs> I had uh, all these different creams and ointments just in case. Yeah, just in case. So uh, Wim Hof actually says, what you pack in your backpack is fear and anxiety. And it's never been truer, I think. So, mm. so anyway, so I'm ready. I'm ready. Nothing's going to get me. And um, we, we get to the Philippines. All my time zones are messed up anyway. And I obviously start eating the local food and, you know, all the different energy enzymes and stuff that are in that food and we get a night bus to a place called Banawi and I just got to sleep and they started shouting Banawi 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 at like four in the morning and woke me up and and I was like, oh little dazed and a little man on the motorbike came and picked me and my girlfriend up and there was nowhere for us to sit other than to kind of grab him really tight and go to the place and anyway that we got a couple of hours sleeping and on a beautiful rice paddy field tour wonderful but then my stomach started to do the thing it needed to do and uh, long story short, there was nowhere to go but the public path that was on the way back to the, the motorbike. So I left a big part of myself on that path one day and I had to then quickly use another couple of bathrooms later. And I remember getting back on this man's motorbike and I was freezing cold. It was really hot. I was sweating. I'd been toilet. I don't know, four or five times by this point, thinking, how the hell is this happening? Uh, Poor path is destroyed. And all I could think was, I'm traveling. I'm actually traveling. This is amazing. (laughs) And it was the best part. That that feeling of I'm dying inside, but I just feel so free. And I've just shat myself on the public path. But it's okay, because it's part. It's not okay for the other people, but it's okay for me. So anyway, so thank you, because I thought I've got my own poo story now. And your poo story, I've heard a few times. I absolutely love that. (laughs) I, I, you know, I think there's a, an important element to the uh, poo genre mm. of travel tale because 
you're you, you know it's metaphorical i guess but you're you're leaving behind part of you you're you're yeah your digestive system is adapting to a new world and it's like getting rid of the old world. And, um, and you're also forced to acknowledge your animality, Mm. you know, and we're so uptight about shit and the fact that we shit and the fact that we fart and that there's this kind of gross process going on. And, you know, so we there's this weird thing in the West where we kind of like think of ourselves as like angels that are, mm. you know, my soul is separate from all this mess <laughs> going on down here. And, you know, that I think we're missing a lot of the fun that way. Right. Uh, one of the best ways to diagnose illness is to look at someone's shit, mm. you know, mm. and uh, because that's a message from inside the body. What's going on there? You know, and uh, people don't really want to hear that. But you know, there's a talking about African expressions. There's another expression that translates to um, you're very lucky if I, how does this go? It's it's you're very lucky if you're cleaning someone's shit, mm. because what that means is you have children oh, or you have old people you're taking care of. You have people you have intimate connections in your life, mm. you know, and so it's a horror. It's gross. It stinks. It's mm. mid, but if you have that kind of connection to other people, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful statement about your life. Yeah. It's a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. In a a strange way. way. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Well, I think what what a brilliant place to end the podcast talking about shit. So (laughs) is there anything else you wanted to to, to say to close us off or anything we've not covered that you wanted to talk about? Uh, No, dude, I I feel like we could talk forever. Yeah. Maybe we'll, we'll, We'll do a part two sometime. I'd love to. Yeah, that'd be great. You ask really uh, interesting questions that, you know, lead to many different places. We haven't talked about breathing. I know that's the the focus <laughs> of, of, I saw your, your I watched your um, episode with James Nestor. It was really good. I haven't read his book yet, but a lot of people have recommended it to me. So it's, I've, I bought it, but it's mm. on that list of books i've purchased but not yet read i'm looking yeah. forward to it. it it's great and it's right up your street as well because it talks a lot about um kind of you know going back to how people used to breathe and the things that we've lost and and how you know now we're not breathing with our bellies properly and you know we yeah. use our mouth for breathing I, i'm really you know i'm a couple of years into this breath journey now but uh it's it's shocking like even today i had, had a podcast with somebody this morning and he was talking about all the science of breath holds and how great breath holding is for you and it's, it's just it, it, you, you think breathing it's such a, a narrow subject but it goes really really deep but then the, the book's great um and i've done i've done actually a part two with james nester which just come out. I got lucky actually because um, I was doing a course on breathing and he said, oh, you should, you should check out this guy. He hadn't had the book out at that point. Mm. And then the week after I did that podcast, he was on Joe Rogan. And it just mm. went boof after that. So yeah. I felt the, I felt the Rogan effect uh, like of that. Yeah, yeah, the Rogan bump. It's pretty yeah. significant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a, it's an interesting subject uh, all by itself. Um, and I know obviously you spent time with, 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 um, Wim Hof, did you, did you do much breathing with him or was it just the cold that you did? Well, I've, I've spent a, a good bit of time with Wim and his family, uh, his son and his daughter. Um, the, so yeah, they're, they're friends at this point. Um, but I've never done the breathing. I, I, the first time I met Wim, he agreed to do my podcast. I was in Spain at the time. And, uh, and they were like, okay, we'll set up a Zoom thing. And I was like, Zoom? No, I'll fly to Holland. I, yeah, I want to cool. meet this guy. And I'm like, really? You fly to Holland? I'm like, yeah, I'll fly up. I have other friends in Holland. So, you know, it wasn't yeah. uh, that big a deal. But uh, yeah, women, I hit it off right away. We, we did the podcast and um, he had filled the ice barrel before the podcast. So the ice was in there, you know, with water yeah. And after he's like, well, you want to get in the ice with me? I was like, fuck yeah, dude, let's, let's go. And so we just went and got in and then we went in the sauna and went back in the ice and back in the sauna. Nice. And, uh, yeah, it was awesome. But I didn't really do any breathing, but I, you know, I've done breathing exercises um, in other contexts. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 
you know, I sort of know how to focus on, on the breath and, mm. you know, breathe through pain or, or what, what have you. Yeah. Um, but it was great. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, we hung out in the Pyrenees for a while. And then I saw him in LA a few times. Mm -hmm. um, we were actually, he, he had rented this beautiful house up near Malibu that used to be owned by Neil Young. So we were, mm -hmm. you know, Neil Young's old hangout for oh, cool. a while. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. But his, his, have you met his children? Uh, were they at the event? No, I met his wife, who was his girlfriend at the time, um, and I had a oh, week with him. Aaron, yeah, yeah. 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 So it was wonderful. Um, well, so his we son, did, oh, no, go ahead. His son is one of my favorite people in the world. His, his name is Anam, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's probably thirty-five or so now. Um, but he is an awesome dude, and, and one of my favorite stories is how he was named. Okay. which tells you a lot about whim. Okay. Um, they're at the hospital and the baby's born and they're, you know, time to go home. And they say, well, you need to fill out these forms. So whim is like, okay, well, what do I sign? And they said, well, you need, what's the baby's name? And he said, well, we haven't named him yet because mm -hmm. we want to see like, you know, what he's like, who mm -hmm. he is, right? Like a hunter gatherer approach to naming. Nice. You, you don't name an <laughs> infant. You wait and see, you know, what their character is. Yeah. And, um, and they said, no, but you can't leave without giving him a name. He has to have a name. And, and Wim's like, but, but I don't want to give him a name yet. And they're like, well, you have to do it. It's the rule. And so Wim writes on the form in Dutch, a name. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's his name. That's his and name. I'm, Brilliant. And I'm, yeah. his, I'm wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised by that story, but it's a great story. <laughs> he's, su great? he's such a tour de force, that guy. He's <laughs> got such an energy and a passion. Uh, yeah. And, you know, being there with a week with him, there was 60 of us. And uh, you see him every day. He's just available. You know, I had breakfast with him several times, sitting opposite him. And you just, you get to experience, have a few beers in the evening. He picks up his guitar. You'd oh, hear yeah. him, you know, playing with his dog. And yeah, it was wonderful. Just, just very briefly, I did the breathing exercise for about 90 minutes at one point. And there's 20 of us doing it and uh, that i've never done any psychedelics or anything to this point um or any plant medicines but i had the most trippy visuals i've ever had and i had this eye come up and i'm a bit like what you said at the start of this i've got a story of a story of a story of a story now so i don't quite feel what i originally felt four years mm. ago but in essence this 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 being whatever you want to call it brain dying i don't know it said hey it's so glad that you found us it's so glad that you're here and then it was like all right see ya take care and it left again and, and i just started crying and started laughing and had this and then we all hugged together that's 20 of us and there's another guy his dad had just killed himself and i think his best friend had just killed himself and he was crying and we just had this big we were strangers we've been knowing each other maybe less than 48 hours and we just had this big hug and, and it was one of the most beautiful moments of my life and that's the power of whim that's the power of breath work and that's what set me really off on the rest of the journey so it was a mm. yeah wonderful one but yeah crazy crazy visuals and i've never been able to get back there since um but it it, it put me on a different path that that day it was uh yeah deep so there you go but uh fantastic yeah. so chris uh i will link to your books below um, I'll link to your podcast as well and uh, and your website. And I just want to say thank you so much for, for being on here. Uh, any last words from you before we we call it a wrap? No, I don't think so. Let's let's do a podcast where you come on my show. I would love to. That'd be fantastic. I want okay. to hear more about the the Camino and and your experiences. Okay, no, that, that'd be wonderful. Uh, I'll wrap it there. So guys, thank you so much for watching. This has been a real dream come true for me. Make sure you go and find all the links below and find all Chris's stuff and get his books if you haven't got them already. Um, and Chris, then until the next time, uh, take care and I'll speak to you soon, everybody. Cheers. Thanks. Okay, thanks for watching. Uh, take a deep breath. Thanks for watching our breathcast. I hope you enjoyed the guest that we just had. Um, just a couple of quick messages. Thank you for sticking through to the end. Really appreciate it. If you enjoyed that and you haven't subscribed, please click that subscribe button um, and leave us a question or a comment because it helps the Google algorithm. Um, and it also means that we can interact and other people get involved and answer questions. So, so leave us a little question. That would be incredible. Um, at the start, I mentioned our other YouTube channel, Hypnotherapy 
Unleashed. Um, if you haven't gone over there yet, we've got a whole host of exercises in the world of hypnotherapy that can help you with addictions, anxiety, depression, and a whole other range of um, things that hypnotherapy can support with. So please go over there and you might find some real value over on that channel. And we're really trying to grow that community at the moment. So if you know somebody that could benefit from that and you wanted to share that, that would be really appreciated. Um, on Instagram, you can follow me at takeadeepbreath.co.uk and we've got regular content there. And finally, in the link below, we have a breath store. So what is that? So we have taken some of our top videos. I say we, it's me. I take some of my top videos um, and um, converted them into an MP3 format. Um, and for just a couple of dollars, four or five dollars, you can go to this little store. You can go through PayPal or through your debit or credit cards, all secure, legit. Um, and you can um, buy one of our MP3s. Uh, and that way you're supporting the channel. But not only that, you get to keep the MP3 for Ever. There's no ads, there's no anything else going on. So you can listen to it on your phone, on the aeroplane when there's no signal, um, and that's yours to keep forever. So, yeah, that's down below, and that's our breath store, uh, which has got, I think, eight or nine different uh, breathing exercises on there. And we're adding more um, as we go. Um, and that's it. So, yeah, so thank you so much from me, um, and we hope to see you on the next exercise or the next breath cast. And if you're finishing this right now and you're thinking, got a few minutes spare, I'm not sure what to do, then try one of the breathing exercises. Box breathing is a lovely way just to help slow things down and relax us you could do some alternate nostril breathing just go and have a look at the channel look at the playlists and pick something for you give yourself a little treat um, and we will see you on the next video thank you very much cheers